once you know it's all frequency and you know that you are creating your reality, you don't get to all of a sudden say, I'm not creating my reality. I created it either unconsciously or consciously in some way. He did say that there will be about 170 billion people that have existed on Earth since we show up here. And I say to that, each of us can be a unicorn. None of us is a replicant of another person. Even the entire universe, it will take it billions of years to recreate a exact copy of who we are. We don't know how complex we are. That is why we, we, we try to mimic other people. I choose to look at a bigger why. That is what we do with people at the Art of Peaceful Living. We help people see the bigger why. Why is it really happening? Now, do you want it to keep happening? Well, stay in that. And if you don't, do something different. Thank you for checking out Obehi Podcast. We encourage people to own their story and share it with the world to expand their purpose. Before we start this presentation, I have something to quickly share with you. Are you a purpose-driven entrepreneur? I mean, do you want to cut across the noise and attract your ID client by leveraging your own story? Then pay attention. I have a signature program that can help you own your story. A five-step transformative journey to reshape your professional and business narrative for success in less than 90 days. And it's available at academy.aclasses.org slash story. This is what we have understood. Storytelling is the most powerful instrument known to man. And this is what that could mean to you. You can either own your story and use it to advance your purpose in your business and professional life, or someone else will do. The choice is yours. Now, let's get started with today's episode of the Obey podcast. Well, to tell you about myself, I, you know, I'll, I'll go with 2024 has been an interesting part of my journey. Just uh, it started with a uh, big part of it has been accepting an award for the work I've done in the world for the last 20 years. And, and that's the World Peace Award uh, for being the ambassador of peace in the world and and they flew flew over to stockholm sweden and got into that and it was very humbling because i i didn't realize how much someone across the pond right someone on the other side of the world has watched what i've been doing so in that space i began to really come into a place of knowing that all right, this is how other people see me. Uh, cause I, I, I'm not, there was something that I had to move through to allow myself to be in the space of knowing me, uh, all the things that I've done in my life and, and going from an athlete at an early age of seven, uh, playing sports in different parts of the world. And, and then going to college and doing that, going into coaching football. And then once I got through coaching football, I went into teaching yoga and traveling the world doing that. So I've always been in this place. It's a little different from a lot of people's journey because it was very much guided. You know, even at an early age, I started meditating at eight because of our my soccer coach that uh, caused us to do that. And so all those different things have opened up in my life that things continue to move forward and, and I continue to progress in that way. And, and that that's it. So it's easy for me to be in this life, yet I do recognize, at least from what people say, how different it really is to live the way I live. As we are entering into the conversation, I'm just imagining everything we are going to be learning today. 
like uh, opening a book and starting with the first page in it, which is often blank in most of the books. Then you open it, then you see the the name. Then you open it, then you see the the chapter, the title, and you start seeing more information. All right, that is the opening page. Now, um, here we spend a lot of time talking about story, and we are really very proud of that. We are not in haste. We believe that we have time to talk about ourselves. So um, with our liberty, permit us to know you as you were much younger. You are an adolescent. Help us to see what you are seeing. I was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1970. And at that time, I, I remember little things that came up for me along the way. Uh, TV cameras that came in when my parents had me as a baby. And and uh, and then, so that I was born into kind of that space where TV and things being seen were part of my life. Uh, even, you know, there's a card that one of my mom's friends wrote and they were kind of joking, but it still landed in my psyche. And it, and, uh, and they said, Hey, we apologize because we haven't been able to come over and see the King yet. And so I, that was just something that's been embedded in me, uh, that, that there was something for me to do bigger than I would probably be able to imagine most of my life. So that was the beginning. And I, I had awesome parents. Yes, there were moments, things that, uh, not that they needed to be different because they were exactly the way they needed to be, but there were tough moments in my life, you know, experiencing racism, experiencing uh, being all over this world has made a different picture, a worldly picture of how I live life now, you know, to go from the south of this country in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, moving to Oakland, back to the south, over to Washington, D.C., living in the Midwest has kind of been my journey to experience all different walks of life from all different perspectives, from all the different religions to realizing that in my life, where I am now, my God is too big for one religion. That's, that's me. Like that's, that's who I've become is somebody that is okay being one with everything. That is really powerful. So this afternoon, uh, before this interview with you, I have interviewed the professor in the UK uh, it's a professor of transpersonal psychology. Of course, it's a professor of very many disciplines. It's a person with a, with a, a big heart. Um, he is an expert also on religion because he teaches people about religion and all of that. But his, his take on it is very different in that um, for most people within the religious circle, they will usually start with, I am the way, the only way. Every other thing is wrong. I am the only one. If you don't follow me, you are wrong. You are on the wrong side. You will find this in Christianity. You will find it in Islam. But the approach of this professor, his name is Professor Lua Femi Esa, is that we can see God from everywhere. You don't need to put God in a bus. God cannot stay inside a bus. God is not... Uh, in the church or in the mosque, God is everywhere, and God is. Uh, in fact, God, most of all, is inside of us. So it is impossible not to be with God if you are alive, even when you die. So I think if we start from there, we don't really need to make conflict now, because nobody is going to be exempted. That. Except you become like me, you cannot know God. No, that is wrong. <laughs> right. I like what you said. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, please go that's on. Like the, that's like the 10,000 year old mind. Like, like are we still going to operate with that mind because we didn't know? Like, we, okay, do we want to actually live in a world that's flat? No, it's round. Like, <laughs> and is it really round? Even if it isn't round, who really cares if it's flat? 
but for some reason you keep going around. It's okay. Like you can go around and eventually if you navigate and you walk, you get on a boat and do all the different things, you will end up in the same point because it goes around. So if that's the case, when I look at the idea that we've evolved in that way, it's time for our our evolution to evolve in our relationship with everything. Our relationship with this thing that we call God, because anybody anybody that's in a human form is calling it God because we don't really know, no matter how I grew up with a world-renowned scientist and, and many of them in my life. And they still don't know the beginning. As much as we know, I don't care who it is listening right now, you don't know everything because you don't even know if there's more than one universe. Like we can act, we can, we can perceive that there's one universe, but we don't know because we're here and that's okay. That's okay not to know and being okay, not knowing, letting go of this idea that we know because we don't know. If you think, you know, think again, let go of that space. Like I, I was talking earlier on our show with the fact that the yoga sutras Patanjali was around before the Ten Commandments. Go look it up for yourself. You don't have to listen to me. Go look up the Yamas and the Niyamas, and then go look at the Ten Commandments and compare the two, and you'll realize how much they are the same. I did a a paper on that, so I, I, I dove deep into that space. So then I was like, all right, well, if it's the same and one of them came before, is really this the only way? Like, let, let's get clear on that. And, and I love my brother, Jesus. I, I lean into constantly the teachings of his, his words that I don't even know if they're his words. I know it says it in the book, but I don't know if they're really his words. Until he comes and tells me they're my words. But I, I'm OK with taking them. And now putting them into the space of who I am right now and who I am right now. Now, living that forward is so important to me. And not only reading the book, become the book. Like I've written a lot of books. A lot of them people say are smart. Well, the books can stay smart. What good does that do? You got to actually put it into practice. That's why I love talking about it as a practice. And that's why I love that. I went through a practice in the in the name of sports because it is just a practice. Yet it is already perfect just being in the practice. So if it's already perfect and I learned something that could be different, then I just do different differently. It's okay to be in that space. It's okay to be in that space. I love that. I love that. that. There is no need to be in haste. There is um, a, um, a history professor in the U.S. that I've interviewed a number of occasions. He too, um, he's very heavy on spirituality. And, and of course, anybody that knows African and understand that as an African, you must be heavy on spirituality because it's about the, the perception, how we see life. That is how we see life. You don't need to belong to any religious group to be spiritual. So he will say, uh, because he's living very close to the border between the United States and Mexico, and of course the argument of uh, we are the best, they are the wrong one, we are the right one, should be obvious to many people now. He will say to the student when he comes to the class, particularly in the beginning of the semester, hey, everyone, you all belong. God accepts you, God loves you, you are all children of God. Now that you know that you belong, what do you do with that? You see, many people all their life live to be accepted. And I think it is wrong. You should know that you're already accepted in the sense that you don't need to prove anything. You are alive. That is, you have the whole of it. You are a full packet. You are not missing. It is said that there have been about 170 billion people that have existed on Earth since we show up here. And I say to that, 
each of us has been a unicorn. None of us is a replicant of another person. Even the entire universe, it will take it billions of years to recreate an exact copy of who we are. We don't know how complex we are. That is why we, we, re, we try to mimic other people. We are the full packet. Anyway, um, tell, tell me a little bit more. Uh, as you are more growing up a little bit, now you are okay, you are in your teenager. What is framing your reference? I'm trying to see what information you are consuming and what is making sense to you. Yeah, I'd have to say that in that middle part of my life, what was making sense was wins and losses. <laughs> Couldn't deny that. Like we either win or we lose. And it, I, I've lived my life off of that. Like, am I winning this moment as a dad? Am I losing this moment as a dad? Am I winning this moment as a son? Or am I losing? Am I winning in school or am I losing? You know, it's what really began to shape me was that that concept of of playing sports and and figuring out am I winning or losing and being able to be gifted enough that we won state championships. We run won three of them in track. We won one in football. I traveled the world playing soccer and it came down to wins and losses. So that for me has shaped my dance with the world. Am I winning or losing? And winning or losing, it's not just based on the game, right? Like the final score on the scoreboard, even though it will be based on the game, the final score on the scoreboard. When I'm all said and done, a guy once said to me, uh, said a couple things. One, he said, he told us about having, being in relationships. And then I'm not going to get into that part, but he said, you're writing two books. And whichever one you fill up more is how you're going to feel at the end. One book are the things that you did. One book are the things that you didn't do. Whichever one has more in it is how you're going to feel in the end. So for me, it's like the bulk of the things that I did are the wins. Good or bad, they're the wins. There's no, there's no good or bad. It's all good. Then the things I didn't do, those are the ones that stick around, that haunt. And if it's too full, then what I've learned and what shaped me was that, that becomes the loss, that that becomes the the struggle in my mind. I can look at from there, you know, getting formed in that way. And then as I got older and I experienced relationships and relationships that fell apart and divorces and all those things, those were the things that began, began to be kind of the losses in my life. And then I also had to win at, in the end, which has happened for me now, I had to win at there. There is no failure. I'm still here. I am beyond failing. I am a success because I am still here, because I do keep going, because I am in this life, because I've chosen to grow over and over and over again. That's the win. And in your time, uh, who were the people that were influencing you? When you look around, you say, okay, you... Okay, you see the Obama of your time, people that were you were looking up to and say, hmm, I want to be like him, or I like what he's saying because of this and this and that. Who were these people? First one, eight years old, Jimmy Carter. Uh, well, I'll go back. My parents. My parents had so many friends and so many people that loved them that I just wanted to be loved. Like, so they they established that 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 space first of wanting to be loved by people viewing their perception of me being a good person meant something. Then came at eight years old, seeing Jimmy Carter on TV and and a little voice in my head said, oh, you could go. You you should go do that. You should go be a Jimmy Carter someday. Now, I love Jimmy because Jimmy's life has been so well expressed. Uh, on giving to other people and taking care of other people and showing up at, at the reservation 
the only president to actually ever go to a reservation, the only president to go to the reservation. And then when he got to the reservation, told his secret service to stay, put on, took off his coat, put on a hard hat and went to work. That shaped me that, that, that image of this person being that way on earth has shaped my life. And then all the people that I've had in, in relationships in my life, whether it was a stranger on a plane, uh, people just walking by people that have been in my life and now are gone. And I've kept many and most of the people that have ever been in my life. I, I still contact them in some way. Everybody shaped me along the way, especially, uh, grandmother Morningstar when I got older and I realized, man, I really need to find peace. She, she stepped in and said, okay, I, I take Sid on as, as my relative and adopted me as a grandson and, and showed me the ropes of being native American and, and living into that. Like I will forever be grateful and, and owe her, uh, Jerry Guyton, who is a mentor of mine. We talk every Friday and, and his love and care and his way of being has been exceptional for my life. And, and ultimately that's my father because my father mentored him. So I, I, I'm, I'm being mentored by my father, even though my father doesn't know the words that he said are being said to me. Uh, so those are some, I mean, I, I taught at the white house yoga. So Obama was somebody that president Obama was somebody that definitely I saw as a, as a solid person, regardless of his policies and things that people get upset about. He was living a life that was worthy to be looked at and looked up to. I thought that was important. I still think that's important. I could go through all the different teachers that taught me yoga, the coaches that taught me to play sports, the coaches that helped me to be a better coach. I've just been blessed to be open to all the relationships that have been in my life. It's full of gratitude now. You are really full of gratitude. And that is that is so good. Because if you are having all this positive thought in your mind, the negative thought cannot be there at the same time because it will be a fight and you don't want to entertain that. So you choose to entertain yourself with the positivity. And that is so good. But was it something that you have been doing since the beginning or did you learn it at the point? Mm -hmm. Well, this is what I know for sure. My first words, most people, their first words, mo a lot of people think they say mom, but mo a lot of, a lot of babies are oming, ohm, mom, same, th same sound. My first words that my mom wrote in my baby book were thank you. So I, I, I've just been grateful in my life. Like I'm fortunate. My mom says, thank you all the time. I would imagine so somehow that came through, like, thank you for giving me life. Thank you for giving me food. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for showing me the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for beating me when I was, when like, I can, I can see the gratitude and everything that I've experienced because even the things that I may have said, oh, back when I was younger, oh, that should have been different. I know what it did for me, you know, to be, to be disciplined the way I was, not very many people have sat on the mountains four days, three nights without food or water and done it four times, let alone done it four times in five years or had the discipline and the, and the wherewithal to say, I'm strong enough to go do that. I'm strong enough to have the discipline because I've been disciplined that I can sit and meditate for two hours a day. And, and it's like drinking water that though that, shape me in such a way that I am grateful for everything. I'm grateful for the, for the struggle because on the other side of the struggle is a new life. I've been stretched. So yeah, thank I, I can honestly say that at least it was my first words, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's been with me as long as I can remember to just say, thank you, to be grateful, no matter what I'm grateful for the people that I don't talk to anymore just because they interacted in my life to get me here. Now, the final thing I'll say on that is I am, I'm grateful for it all because that's how I am, who I am. If I didn't like me, I probably would somewhere along the line, I wouldn't be liking something about my life that got me to be me.
I love me. It, it, like I'm real solid on that. I'm solid on when I look in the mirror, I smile at myself. And I know in my head, I'm saying, man, I just, I just love, love the person that's looking back at me. And for anyone, and there were, that wasn't always the case, but pretty much my mom put a lot of mirrors in my baby crib. For those that may look at their own reflection and be like, ah, I don't like what it is. Well, start looking at what you can be grateful for about yourself. Like, did you take a breath today? I had asthma, 10 seconds to live, couldn't breathe. I'm grateful for the breath that I have. Life has dealt me some things that it's like, man, I'm grateful for my sight. I've gone blind twice in my life. I've lost the use of everything in my body a couple of times in my life. So I'm grateful to just put my feet on the floor when I wake up in the morning that they're still there, that they're operating, that I can stand up. Now, I, for some reason, created all those things in my life so that I could experience them, so that I could be grateful for everything about me and everything that got me to be me. I am grateful to have that level of peace with all that I've been through. The ways of the elders are usually very, very wise. They are very peaceful. Okay, there are some elders that also add stupid. But in generality of it, elderly people are always very peaceful mm-hmm. because they are speaking from experiences. They have been molded by circumstances, by events, by things that have happened in life, which the yoga people haven't had the chance to see yet. We might make them to be very, um, to be running around all the time, trusting only their energy. Whereas the elder trust on their experience, and experience is always better than just the energy. And so that um, in Africa, it is said that what an old man sees sitting down, a young person even on top of the tree cannot see it. <laughs> they are talking about experiences. Because that elder city down have seen everything that is possible for him to see in life. You can't surprise him anymore. He knows the game, front and back and inside out. And is there as a living library. Because life has happened to him and to her too. So what have happened to you that mold you into who you are today? Because your words are very wise. And for you to be wise, okay, for you to be speaking from experience, you need to first of all have the experience. Like, when you take the dust that usually become gold or diamond, they're like the dust of the earth. But when you finish the work on there, after you made them to pass through the fire, you burn out the shaft, you put them down, there is no way anybody can make mistake thinking that maybe it's just the dust. It's not the dust. It's different because it have passed through experiences. So what are some of those experiences in your life that make you this wise, that make you this refined? Share with us. You know, it's the cycles that have happened. Um, I look at one cycle. At 15 years old in England, I lost my sight. It came back. Let me go back before that. At three years old, I had an operation, a surgery, that I went to the light. I don't know what happened on earth. My parents have never really talked about it, but I I talked to my sister about it, and she was like, yeah, I remember that. And I went to the light, and the light said, son, I got you. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about that. It really doesn't. I know what it was, right? Like I experienced it. It doesn't matter what anybody says in their book. I don't, that doesn't mean much to me because I experienced, son, I got you. So when when I lost my sight at 15 years old and my dad and I was in England and my parents lived in the US, I was in England playing soccer and football and lost my sight. And it was gone for three days. And my dad said, do I need to come? I said, God's got me, man. I'm good. That 
that got me to where a couple of years ago, 2022, I lost my sight again. And I just had faith. I knew God's got me no matter what it needs to look like. If they need to cut into them, if I, if I can sit with it, however it needs to go, God's got me. I can see I'm looking at this screen right now. Easy. I couldn't see it before. So that that right there was a big stretch for me. I've I've been in a lot of things in my life. I, 2016, I lost the use of every muscle in my body. Couldn't move. Uh, and I had faith. I knew God had me. And I said, God, if you if you need me to be crippled. And you still want me to teach, I promise you I'll teach. So that that's molded me. Like the experiences, the having a shark come bump me when I'm surfing and not attack, when I'm like at peace, that shapes me. That causes me to look at things differently. Like, oh, man, if I had been frantic, that shark would have just gone right through me. But instead, it was just like, here, let's bump, see what this thing is. Okay, cool. Thank you, Mr. Shark. Have a good night. Have a good day. I'm in your living room. Let's not let's not play right now. You know, so all the different things that challenged me actually gave, taught me peace. I had a relationship with somebody, and she was very combative, and we had a combative relationship. She might say I was combative. But I'm here to tell you that that relationship taught me I wanted peace. That it didn't matter about the other person. I wanted peace. So it takes two to fight and one to have peace. It takes two people to have an inauthentic relationship. It takes one to make it authentic. I have chosen because of moments like that to be the one to bring peace, to be the one to be authentic. I know what pe a lack of peace in my body caused me to not be able to move. So, yeah, my peace is too expensive to give away. So I hold peace. It's easy. Like I just hold peace because I, on the other side is my body might shut down. That's not optional. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that sharing. Now we're talking of also the, the moral lesson because things will happen to us. Things will always happen to us. And it doesn't depend on us. But our reaction depends on us. That is, what do we do about it? You see, you can't stop the raid from falling. You, you can't do that. That is beyond you. You can't stop other people for being who they are. And who they are, something can be bad. But you always can control how you react to that. Yeah, you love your peace and you are keeping it. Yes, but I, I, I'd say, you know, I used to think that I needed to be at peace with all the stuff happening. I then, and that, that you're correct, 100%, like, because things can happen that may be out of my control. Cause there's something bigger, right? Like the hurricanes that came through Florida. Now, for some reason, the hurricanes go around me. You can look, go look at the maps. They start off coming right at Jacksonville and go around us. Not just me, it goes around everybody else too in Jacksonville. Now, what I will say from my own life, I can't say what other people are going through. Because they probably go somewhere else. They probably left when it started coming if they didn't have enough peace because they were warned to get out of here. For me, it goes beyond just keeping peace because there's a hurricane. It goes beyond, it goes beyond that. So then I look inside and say, what is the actual frequency that I am dialed into that is creating the storms of my life? I know that I can only see from my eyes. So it can, I've actually stood in a place on earth where the sun is shining. It looks like a line. And on the other side of the line, the sun is not shining and raining. Like think about a storm 
somewhere the storm stops. So that that place that I just described is somewhere at the edge of the storm that you may be in. Why is that? I choose to look at a bigger why. That is what we do with people at the Art of Peaceful Living. We help people see the bigger why. Why is it really happening? Now, do you want it to keep happening? Well, stay in that. And if you don't, do something different. Shift the frequency, the frequency inside of yourself. I, I often wondered, having lived in California and lived on the East Coast and lived in the South and lived in the Midwest, why, is, why was it always so sunny in su Southern California? When you come across, it's not so sunny. Directly across, same longitude, latitude, let's go across. I mean, the ocean's colder in California, but it's not as cold in on the east coast like all those different things why is that but then i had to look at okay well how are the people living the diamond cutters the diamond cutters the buddhist monks they described all things going on with humans in the weather and everything that happens around them one example is infidelity humans having infidelity and i've lived in a town where it had more pollution in the air than any other place. And it wasn't because they had a bunch of factories. Yet I know there was a lot of sleeping around infidelity and that and the diamond cutters say human infidelity creates pollution in the world. I just pay attention. I, I choose to be aware. I choose to know and seek the truth says it in that book, seek the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, I choose to be free. I, I don't want to be controlled by anything or, it, or anyone. I choose to be free. I want to be free. So I consciously watch over and over and over again, what can I pay attention to that is allowing the sun to come out right now? Now, how do you really draw your lesson? Uh, when you see the things that are happening around uh, to other people, to you, to the situation where you are, to your ecosystem, how, how do you really draw the lesson that sort of come to influence uh, your behavior? I pick up the lesson by, at this point in my life, I mean, it used to be, what do I want, right? So I, I knew what I wanted in life. So then was this choice making in the moment going to give me the outcome of what I want. And if not, then I'm not making the choice. Eventually, you know, no one had to tell me that uh, 17 years ago, stop drinking alcohol. It wasn't giving me the outcome that I wanted. I didn't want to be hungover. So I stopped drinking alcohol. Like, I knew I wanted to be sober. I wanted to feel good in my body, my mind, and my spirit. Stop drinking alcohol. Yeah. Then wait a minute, why do I still feel like this? Sugar, sugar in my life wasn't producing. Eventually along the way, so I, I let go of sugar three years ago. Did it before, but then I put it back, so then I had to let it go again. Eventually I got to a point that I, I knew peace was my guiding light. So it's easy for me now. I just make choices on peace. Person is a situation, is this thing gonna bring me peace? And if not, it's not part of my reality. So I feel like that someone needs to know their true north, what points them forward to where they want to be. It just so happens that it is peace and will always be peace for the rest of my life. I am reaching for peace. So if the argument doesn't look like it's gonna bring peace, then I'm not in it. If the argument looks like it needs to happen in order for peace to happen, we're gonna get in the argument until we find peace and common ground so that we can move forward from having this ever come back up. If, you, if you're stumbling, I think at some point you will choose to know what actually is bringing you to whatever you wanna call it. I call it peace, you could call it love, you could call it joy, you could call it freedom. All right, are you really making those choices? It, it, you know, yes, even a coach needs a coach because sometimes I know there's things that I haven't known that a coach or a mentor or a teacher has been able to tell me about their experience. And then I get to choose how I want to do the experience and move it forward. So, yes, I, I do recommend that a coach gets a coach. And 
you have to do the work, no matter who you are. But what is peace? What does it mean to you? Can you explain it? Yeah, I can explain it. See if I've gotten better in my explanation of peace. Everything is a frequency. Everything taps into a frequency. Peace is a frequency that is free of the outward circumstances. Peace is the highest frequency that a person can experience before being fully enlightened. Peace has no opposite. You're either at peace or you are not. Peace is something, the only thing that doesn't need a relationship to something else to be like to be at peace it's you no matter what goes on outside of you you either are or you aren't to be love you need to give love to something you need to do love with something to love is something that is happening because of the relationship to it peace just is so being at peace is learning to be no matter what the circumstance or thing that's happening around is. That's why it's the highest frequency before enlightenment. Dr. Hawkins, many other people have actually measured it and know that peace is the highest frequency. You're at peace. There is no sickness. There's no sickness. You're at peace. No sickness. You're at peace. You're experiencing love. Peace is the foundation that gives access to love. When you lose that foundation, even though love is everywhere, it came from the thing that gave us peace. Love is everywhere. Yet, when someone loses their peace, they don't even experience the fact that that is love. So then, all right, why would that make peace the highest frequency? Because when you're at peace, you actually see that all of it is love. And then you're able to practice being thankful and have gratitude because you're at peace with it all. That's what peace is for me. Okay. So for somebody who wants to be at peace, are there some recommendations? Are there some things that an individual can do to be at peace? first one is find somebody who's truly at peace like you let's put this in simple terms you want to go to the store and let's say the store is called i'm trying to think of a great store to go to all right you want to go to and i'm also cognizant of who's getting advertising right now you want to go to the store we're just going to say the god store you want to go to god store well if you want to go to God's store and you don't know where it is, how are you going to do it? You could go ask Google GPS, wherever you are in the world. And if somebody has been there before and they put it into the computer, it can give you the map to God's store. So if you want to go to God's store, you better go find the person that's already been to God's store. And then ask them and be quiet. Just listen. Because if you knew how to get there, you would already be there. If you know how to get to peace, don't come to me. You already know how to get there. Live there. You don't need me. Now, if you really want it and you've not been there and you don't have people that are around you that have been there, come find me. We can get to peace. So that, that would be it. Make sure that if you want to learn to play soccer, you want to learn to play football, you want to learn, 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 learn. You want to learn how to fly a rocket ship, you better go find somebody that's done it before. It's all been done before. And if you can't find somebody on earth, start trying to figure out how you can talk to somebody that isn't on earth. You could talk to Jesus and figure it out there. Talk to Buddha. You could talk to Muhammad. Talk to them. And, and guess what? Being at peace would never look like destroying yourself. That's losing the peace. 
it would be being where you are. As you are. Be at peace with that. And I, I'm I'm hopeful and I'm grateful for all the people that come and say, hey, Sid has what has direction to go. And the beautiful thing is, I mean, I've had people in, in my life since being this level of teacher since 2003. And they're still here and we're still going together because I'm growing, too. So then all of a sudden I get my GPS takes me to a new place and then I can tell someone this is what it looks like to go produce a movie. This is what it looks like to write the book. This is what it looks like to become the producer. This is what it looks like to be the coach. This is what it looks like because I've done it. The false prophet tells you what they read in a book. They've never done it. So that's why you'll probably pass them up quickly. But when somebody's really in it, you're walking with them. We're all walking each other home. So go find that person. It, be in relationship. The guru. I know people don't like to use that word for some reason. Someone weird started saying that that's a bad word. Well, guru means somebody that's in the light and can show you the way to the light from the darkness where you are. So I'm cool with the gurus, <laughs> like the people that can show me a little, little different slice of light. Thank you very much. We'll walk as long as we need to walk. It just so happens that I've met the greatest guru because the guru resides inside of you. Someone showed me how to get there. That is very beautiful. You're not taking the people to a place now. You are taking them to themselves. That is so beautiful, yeah. no? That is freedom. That is liberty. That is the thing that people are looking for that made them to climb the mountain. They are trying to reach themselves. If only they have been told that the journey is inside. You know, sign of the cross. I've changed the sign of the cross for me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I've, I've shifted that. I go, Father, in my heart, Son, my mind, Holy Spirit, all these things operating to get me here. In my heart, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's something to looking in. God's not up there. It is up there. God is everywhere, but God is in here. And if I go in, this is the direct relationship I have with it. In here. The, the longest journey a person typically will make is 18 inches from their head to their heart. You got to start looking in. You got to go here. So I, when it comes to father, I'm like, father, where are you? Where are you? You're beating my heart. I need to know you. Like when I'm sitting and I meditate the first after I've gotten to my breath, I'm present to the moment. I'm here. I'm right now. And then I go in. I go here before I go here. I go here before I go here, because if I go here, it becomes powerful. It can do all the things, but it, it gets lost. If I go here, I'm humble to it. I'm in it. I'm bowed to it. My, I've let go to get in. So I, that's what I'd say for anyone looking to find that. Go in first. Go in. And when you're with somebody, go in. When you see... When, when I've had the pleasure of sitting with people and I, I know I, I people get lost in my eyes now. I learn to be looking in. And because I'm looking in, people get drawn in. And when they get drawn in, they actually go into themselves. And if they're blocked, it, it starts chipping away at the, the layers in there. So they can go in and then come out. So go in. Get into the practice for yourself. Thank you for that. Now, somebody might be wondering, um, what is the cost of peace? What would you say? Right, everything. Everything. And nothing at the same time. It costs you everything, but it's actually free cost me everything because it was like anything that didn't look like peace in my life had to go. All the relationships, all the, all the stuff had to go. And then I have access to everything. 
So it's it's everything and nothing all at the same time. The cost, it's too costly. Think about if we were to lose peace. Fortunately, there's something that causes everything to keep peace. So we're not pressing the nuclear warheads that could be launched in this planet that would affect the whole universe, the atmosphere. So then that would be the cost. When I've lost peace, I've lost my body. That's the cost. When I've lost peace, I've lost myself. It's too costly. My piece is too expensive for anybody. You don't get to buy that one. You won't even get a shot. I don't care. Every People say everybody has a, has a price. Nah, the price is my piece. You don't get it. No matter who you are. You, that's why I don't even come to me with these kind of things. <laughs> Nobody comes to me. I, hey, man, I'd like, to, I'd like to offer you this. Is it going to cost me my piece? Well, you can go you can go somewhere else with that so i'd have to say that it's too costly what is the price of peace it's too costly there is no price that would ever even come close to it this is a full lecture we are really honored to have you here thank you so much for that and of course to the listener we ask you if you find any value here let us know it doesn't cost anything just leave your comment a simple word like thank you to the guest here can be enough. We're talking of gratitude. He's spending his time here to share with us, to enlighten us. And it's enlightening us because you have gotten his enlightenment because you can give what you don't have. So something as minimal as say thank you to him can be all that we really need to continue to do this. So if you have gotten any value here, let us know in the comment section. Share with other people too, because we are here to serve you. We are here to bring you this enlightenment. If you are getting something from us or getting something from the conversation, let us know. All right, now tell me something, Signe. Uh, this is important, the Peace Award. People want to know about that. Tell us something about it. Well, I have to say that one of the most humbling moments of my life, because uh, one, I didn't even know that there was a such thing, as many people may not know, as the World Peace Award. So when I was told I was receiving this award, I had to go through the process of, is this such a thing? And then it, many people told me it was such a thing. And, and it is for the work that that people around the world. I mean, there were 55 countries there. Um, there were over, there were hundreds of people there. Uh, and there were 30 monks there. So I, I got to actually be in front of people that their life was dedicated to peace and to stand up and get an award in front of these people. It's just a, a major honor. And then to come home and begin to look up these people like there's this guy, uh, Master Amnar. He's got thousands upon thousands of paintings that are like, you could actually stack him. He's like 6'2". You could stack him at least three times next to these paintings. He paints with a samurai sword and knives. Absolutely the most detailed paintings I've ever seen. And he paints with a samurai sword and knives. I met men that have been like the Dalai Lama exiled from China and their life has been ordained since being birthed. So to receive an award from people that stand in that way and to see how they're doing it was very humbling for me. Uh, and, and that's what I'd say, you know, and so it, it inspired me to turn it up too. like, to, all right, can't doubt it now. People, people across the world are talking about it. The work that I've done with people, then I got to own it. And that that's what it propelled me to do is to step into something bigger for myself, for sure. Okay. Tell me about the feeling. Uh, the feeling is important. How do you feel when you are uh, described as a person that has the Peels Award? How does it feel to be at peace? Access to anything and everything. I mean, when I when I feel peace, I feel 
confident in myself, when I feel peace, I, I, I let go of all the guards, like the guard of, did I say the right thing or not? Like, who, who cares? I'm at peace with it. I, I know I've done the work to, to speak from that place inside. And, and so that, that's what I would say. Peace really feels like in that nature of what you asked, I'm okay. I'm good enough. It's exactly the way it needs to be. It's perfect. It feels perfect. I feel that level of perfection that everything is exactly the way it needs to be. And, and it just propels me forward. The Secret Weapon. That is your book. <laughs> Tell people about that. What is that book about? Uh, why do you call it a secret weapon? Well, evolution has called it the secret weapon. Because initially, as I wrote that book, uh, and I'll tell you, it started, my wife and I sold everything in 2019 and hit the road and uh, literally sold everything. Then when we finally settled, we had to go buy all new stuff, new beds, new couches, new, all the stuff that we have now is basically new since then, since 2022, when we finally settled here. And what are 2000? 21. And what I'll say that came forward from that was we drove around, um, called to different places to teach, to help people heal through different things. And then the pandemic hit. We were in the Dominican Republic, had to come back and lived for a while without a house and all that stuff. And eventually we settled in Atlanta. I said, I need 30 days to write this book. It took me three days to write that book. I had made a commitment to God. There are 2.9 billion uh, Christians in the world. There's 1.9 billion Muslims. The next greatest uh, connection of people around religion is 1.2 billion spiritual people without a direction of how to do it that are just doing it. And I said, God, give me the book that'll bring them home. So the book started out with the title, Those Who Know God. I changed the title because I was asked to come speak at a company that had 85,000 employees, they wanted to buy the book, but because they were connected to the government, they couldn't buy a book that said God on the cover. So then it became the secret weapon and they were a defense contractor. It became the secret weapon. And now the special edition is coming out December 11th because I've added to it. I added to practice. I added uh, journaling prompts. I added the way for people to become their own secret weapon. And it's the secret weapon, how, how to win, how to peacefully win in life. And that that's where it is now. So it, it, it evolved so much from when we left, I didn't even know that that was the book I would, had in me uh, to come forward. Cause I had just written the warrior within thought that that was where I was supposed to teach from as the foundation, but the secret weapon was birthed and it is now the foundation of how we teach. So, it that's where it, that's how it came to be and uh excited to continue to bring those lessons forward for people it it goes from reading a book that tells you what to be like to reading a book that shows you how you can be in relationship to it and create the life be the creator that creates the life of your dreams because your dreams, everybody has them. All right. Now, tell me, uh, in that speaking engagement uh, that you went to do um, with, with the military, was it? Uh, I was with a defense contractor. So they have a lot of military people. They are, they're on naval bases around the U.S. They build, they build the weapons. Uh -huh. They build the weapon. All right. Yeah. So... Um, Tell me, what was the message that was important for them in this book that they contracted you to come and speak to them about their uh, weapon production? Yeah, well, at the time we were coming out of the pandemic 
and they had to tell their employees that they all had to take the vaccine. So there was no peace about that. They were peaceful about building weapons, but they didn't want to come take the vaccine. They didn't trust in that. So they asked me to come and bring my teachings to help them find peace so that their employees would come back to work. So that's what the message was about and and started out speaking to the HR department, the human resources department, helping them navigate what those conversations would really look like with their employees. And then it was a overall uh, conversation with their employees. I mean, it it really is. I as I look at it now and which many people ask me to come to their companies with conflict negotiation. How do you get around a conflict? You find peace. And when you can find peace, then you get beyond the conflict because you start to communicate and have union to get to the other side of that. Now, from your recollection, and that may be through comment or maybe through feedback, uh, how did the people receive the message? Um, uh, okay, say so let's use this uh, particular conference that you went to, for example, because it was because of them that you have to change the, the title. Uh, so it is important what they feel about it at the end of the day. Uh, they are producing weapons. Uh, so how did they feel about the message that you delivered to them? Well, you know, what was interesting was, like, I initially, my thought was, hey, you all need to keep doing what you're doing. It's okay that you're doing what you're doing, that you're producing weapons. Is that the way to peace? Possibly. Like, think about we have a weapon in the nuclear warheads that we know if we actually use them, we perish. So then we don't use them because we'd be gone. So there's peace in that. There's peace in the fact that, all right, if we even get there, I got the most peace I have is I, I run into warriors, people that that can hold their own Navy SEALs, Rangers. Uh, people that box and do all the different things. And the, what's beautiful about it is we never get to anything that takes us into that place because we have that level of peace with each other because we know it could get really destructive if we went there. So that that was something that I that I watched come forward. Many of the people still tune into things and come and and participate in things because they realize holding that level of peace keeps it all for them, which then a lot of them have stopped drinking at night because at first they, they weren't at peace. How do you get peace? Escape. Escape in alcohol, escape in marijuana, escape your life because it's not peaceful. When it becomes peaceful, you don't get to escape. You don't need to escape. Even if you smoke, you you stay at this place because you're already at a higher vibration than that can even take you. So I, I've watched that for people and especially for the people that were involved in in the human resources and the employees that stayed in touch. They began to have peace. And then they, all of a sudden they started, oh, well, I, I'm having peace of work with myself. How do I have peace in my life with my partner like it once i found it in me even it began to echo and it was like okay i have peace in here i need to have peace with my wife i need to have peace with my family i need to have peace and it's like okay i'm at this place i want peace for the world but it starts inside first the peace starts inside first all right now somebody might be wondering uh what is actually the connection between peace and you know, weapons of war, for example? How do you reconcile that? I don't know if somebody has ever asked you that question before. You know, it's like in someone's personal life. They may not have peace with their family. Holidays are coming up. They have to build boundaries. Well, that's weapons. They may not look the same because you think, oh, no, it's not hurting as many people. Yeah, you, if you don't have those boundaries, that you could lose your peace. Well, if you don't have, if someone doesn't think that you are strong, you may not have your peace. So it doesn't mean that you need to use them. 
uh, St. Augustine, the first city settled in the United States. St. Augustine was all about war. Prepare for war, prepare for war, prepare for war. Because in that preparation, we don't have to go to war. Someone knows that you have it, you don't have to go to war. Because they don't even want to step into that. Think about the, the empires that brought peace. They brought peace once everybody knew they were in that space. Now, there's also the greatest empire of example, Manu, uh, the African king that was worth $400 billion. He would go and he could break down the war thought because his kingdom was built of gold. He would show up with gold and give a new city all the gold they needed. And they would just come. That that's that, that's enlightenment. That's the other side of it. But yet I reconcile it because even the dark lord that rids the world, think about how they describe the devil. The devil wants to take away you were bad, you get to come to hell. That's how they put that out there. I don't believe in that. Yet you get to come to hell because you did the bad. So it's what's it doing? It's creating peace by taking all the negative and putting it away. And then you have Jesus on the other hand. This is Christianity, Catholicism. You have Jesus on the other hand that's bringing it from life, that light, love. That's the light. But they're both trying to get to peace. So how do I reconcile it? Get to peace. By any means necessary, get to peace, own the peace. And when you enlightened it enough, you realize you don't need the weapons. You can just get to peace. Yeah. So there is no good or bad. It just is. Now, we're all enlightened. Everybody listening to this is enlightened. Turn the light all the way up. Most people are walking around with a dim light. Turn it up. Sun came out a little bit more. Let's keep turning it up. Uh, as we're moving towards the end of the conversation, I am sort of um, wondering: Is it possible that we can enforce peace uh, through out of violence, for example? Uh, I think one person will say that peace is absent of conflict; in that there is no war, therefore we are at peace. But what if that peace is as a result of the fact that someone is not able to make trouble? Therefore, the person is held against his or her we. Therefore, that is peace because there is no war. Because you cannot fight because you are not able to fight the person who you want to fight. For this reason, there is no fight. There is no fighting. Therefore, there is no war. Uh, but there can also be another peace where we both agree to keep peace because it is good for me, it's good for you, not because you force me to keep peace. So I'm trying to say, if we can even reason it like that, can we force peace because the other is not able to make trouble, therefore we say we are at peace, or because the other is at peace because we both understand that this is good for us, for me, and for you. Can we reason it like that? I would look at it I do look at it from a different angle. And the angle is, if I teach peace, you'll want peace. If I teach you how to be in peace, you'll want peace. A baby wants peace. It already knows that. Dirty diaper, screams till it gets a clean diaper. Peace is back. Hungry. We learn it coming in. That's a human experience. Someone is content and they get pain. Peace is gone. They want peace back. Learned it already. Someone has pleasure. They get happy, 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 happy. And then the pleasure is gone. They experience pain. They want peace back. So pleasure and pain are one and the same. They both take you to misery. Now, if I empower somebody to let go of attachment, to be okay with no matter what it is, 
they have peace and they just want peace. So I teach peace. And I let go of the idea of making someone else wrong. There is no wrong. I teach them peace. That's it. There is no conflict if they have peace. I just teach peace. And stop having a conflict with the lack of peace. Have peace. It's not, it's letting go of this idea of needing to be in the duality of things and realize that there is peace or there isn't. There is peace in existence or there is nothing. Choose peace, teach peace, be peace, and you'll have peace. Would you rather give peace at the expense of justice or would you rather get justice uh, instead of peace? Say maybe for example, uh, if, people, I, if I have peace, it, yeah, I'll have justice. Yeah, please, please explain. Yeah, peace gives, peace gives peace gives me the access to all these things that people perceive as this is love, this is good, this is the relationship of it. If I have peace, I have everything. If I have peace, I have justice because the injustice is not peaceful. If I have peace, I have love because if I don't have love. The opposite of love is indifference is really nothing. Yet, if I don't, that's agape love, God's love. But this human form of love, if I don't have love, then I have anger. Well, if I have peace, I'm accessing love. If I don't, I'm accessing anger. See, peace is the foundation. It's the line that's here. It's the line. It's where we are. And when I'm in the illusion I'm below the line and I experience all things related to fear. When I'm in the reality, the real, I experience all things related to love. So I just teach peace. Just teach peace. And when I get caught, you know, like politics, our politics are really interesting right now. If I get caught in politics, once I get out of the illusion that the politics are real, I come back to peace and then I gain access to love and I can just go help somebody if they need help. So it, teach peace, be peace, we'll have peace. Yes. All right. Uh, this is the last question I'll, I'll ask you before we move to the, the, the concluded part. Um, if we put a person in prison, um unjustly, I would make the person feel peaceful in the sense that there is there is nobody coming to harm the individual, but he remains in prison unjustly. Would that well, can we call that peace? What would we choose if we were to be in a position of such an individual? Well, it's a hypothetical that I don't know because obviously I've not been that. Well, no, I've been in jail unjustly. And looking back at that experience, I became more peaceful. I was so at peace that when they put me in the cell, I just went to meditate. And I remember hearing the keys at the door because they were about to bring someone else in and the guy looked up and he's like, nah, you ain't going in there with him. He's, he's, he's peace. He said that he's at peace. We're putting you over here. And I got out because they realized all the things going on. So anyway, when I look at this idea of someone being in unjustly and I to be a tall order for anyone, keep peace. Because instantly people see it differently. Keep the peace. There's plenty of times people go in unjustly, but then they, they, they're getting beat up or whatever. And I, you know, tall order. Getting beat up or however that's happening in their experience, and they lose the peace. So they say, "Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll just, I'll just say I did it." Now they got to go figure out, actually, they really didn't do it. It was corrupt, blah, 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 blah. For whatever reason, that's the, that's the experience that person has called into their frequency. 
once you know it's all frequency and you know that you are creating your reality, you don't get to all of a sudden say, I'm not creating my reality. I created it either unconsciously or consciously in some way. And that can be a tall order to take that level of accountability. I spoke to 50 guys coming off death row in Jamaica. They learned from their teacher to use their breath to be calm. This is what got them off death row. Death row. Because Jamaica, you went in, if you went to jail, death row. <laughs> like you could have stole something small, death row. Like you were just on death row. There was, you are going to face death. Their teacher taught them to be peaceful with their breath, to realize that every breath you take in, you're breathing in and you are producing the reality as you breathe it back out. So much that when their guards went on the whole, all the police department, the correctional people went on strike, the inmates, the prisoners held such peace that they reversed everybody on death row and freed these 50 guys. Now, they weren't unjustly accused. They just demonstrated that level of peace that they got off death row. 50, I spoke to them. I flew out there. Like, I know what it's like. This is, this is real-time experience. So I'm saying find peace. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate yeah. that. Now, for people that want to uh, connect with you, I want to work with you, I want to learn more about your message because the message, message of peace, it can never be underestimated. It's power. How can it reach you? Yeah, I love that you said that. And, and uh, Desmond from Jamaica said that yesterday. Peace is power. Head over to artofpeacefulliving.com. You can also find Art of Peaceful Living on Instagram, on LinkedIn. And then also Sid McNary, my name, S-I-D-M-C-N-A-I-R-Y.com. Sid McNary on all social media platforms. And again, Art of Peaceful Living is where we do business through is different ways for you to join in and, and open up to things for yourself. Every Sunday we have 2.30 uh, Eastern time. We have Sunday gatherings that's by donation. So it's free for anyone. So there's really no reason. And you know, we wanted to make it that way that there was to be unreasonable, have no reasons for why you don't find peace in your life. So we made it that you can come in and you can access. I've done videos on Instagram, one minute video every day for the last 300 plus days. You can, you want to go back? That's 300 hours worth of 300 minutes worth of content that you could look at and learn how to put peace in your life. How much do you want it? If you really want it, you can come join the Master to Peace program. It's, uh, you know, if you need to, we can go through and figure out a scholarship for you. And you may have to stop going to Starbucks for your coffee. Because if you give up that $5 every day for 30 days, that's $150 a month. If, if you need to pay that versus what people pay to be in it, we'll figure it out for you. Have no reasons. Be unreasonable for yourself. Find peace in this world. No reasons. Not the leaders. It's you. Are you going to lead us out into a better way for the world? Are you going to be the reason that we have peace? Or are you going to be something else? I choose to be the reason that we will all have peace. I invite you to walk that with me at theartofpeacefulliving.com. That is a good advice. It's a good message. Uh, and people need to listen. Was that a final thought or would you want to conclude it with uh, a different message? Because the conversation really has been in-depth and really very powerful. You know, let me, uh, I'll go with this. Pay attention. Wake up. Wherever you are, just wake up. Wake up to see where you are in this moment. If you want peace, commit to it right now. Commit to it for 
24 hours. You finally have it for 24 hours, commit to it for a week. You have it for a week, commit to it for a month. You have it for a month, commit to it for a year. You have it for a year, commit to it for your life. You'll know why. Just commit to it right now for 24 hours. If you don't make it 24 hours, it's okay. Start over, get back in, commit again. Make the commitment. It's too costly not to have it in your own life. In my life, too, I look forward to meeting in person someday so that we can walk in peace together. Thank you so much, Signe. That is really power. And I appreciate the work that you are doing in this world. Thank you very much, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate being here with you and, and uh, really appreciate you letting people share their voice. That's where we are as, as a species. We're We've gone through, we've learned how to be present with the breath. We've learned how to be in our hearts from many teachers. We're learning how to use our voice and speak and raise the energy in the body, right? Through the chakras, through the shashuna, so that it comes all the way through to the crown. So we connect from our feet to the top of our heads so that we can embrace that level of enlightenment. Peace is the highest frequency available for you before enlightenment. Find it. Thank you. That is power. <laughs>